So, <laughs> but, uh, not quite a little uh, kind of fight match today or cage match, but I want to welcome everybody back to Hand Fellowship Virtual Debate. So we have a special this week hosted by Stanford Hand. I uh, really want to thank Dr. Ladd, Dr. Yao, and the rest of the Stanford faculty, fellows, and residents for hosting this. So I know this has been a pretty rough time for everybody, I think, across the country. Things are opening up a little bit there. So it's been, it's been tough for everybody. I think there is some cause for celebration. Um, the fellows across the country who have participated have done an outstanding job. So great presentations, debates. Faculty, mentors, and moderators, thank you so much for all you've done. It's been a great opportunity for education for everybody. Thank, and I learned from this more than anything is just really learning perspectives from everybody. Also just the incredible collegiality and just the willingness for everybody to share their knowledge and educate fellows and trainees from across the country. I think it's been tough, but there's been some positive from this whole situation as far as another learning platform for everybody. It's been great to see everybody across the country, stay somewhat engaged and connected. And again, I just wanna thank everybody for uh, allowing this uh, virtual debate and webinar to continue to happen and for your continued enthusiasm. Um, as you probably have heard, Zoom happy hours become kind of a the new normal for everybody. And bartenders have actually become very busy and there's a really uh, hard time for everybody with their uh, cocktail hours and mixology classes online. So this week, we're going to, today we're going to have cocktails led by Dr. Ladd and uh, Dr. Dentururi, one of the Stanford Ortho residents and Stanford hand team. And then we have a panel of three expert faculty, each with their disaster cases, and they have a free pass to call on any other faculty and uh, pimp them. And from there, I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Ladd. Great. Thanks, Dr. Huang. Uh, I echo everybody's enthusiasm of what a relief this has been for our fellows and residents and certainly the faculty. So what a great opportunity. And there definitely has been silver linings for all of us. And um, in this particular one, so Sahi Dendaluri, or one of our future hand surgeons and hand surgery colleagues, um, is an expert mixologist. He's done fun little parties for the residents, even the faculty. And he gave a talk recently and he interspersed a few things about mixology and, and invited him to potentially give a bit of history and invite quarantine inspired drinks. And I hope you did receive some of those recipes and tried some out. Um, this is the penicillin, which is scotch based. I've only had one sip, it's pretty potent. Um, so I'll turn that over to Sahi. So you are going to take over the screen and then we'll come back on. Thanks, Sahi. Well, thank you, Dr. Ladd. I hope everyone can see my slides. I want to thank Dr. Ladd and uh, all my mentors here at Stanford for uh, not only giving me the opportunity to do this, which I think is very unique and something that uh, uh, I will enjoy for uh, quite some time to come, uh, but also for just mentorship in general and uh, helping me uh, curate my interest for hand surgery and. Uh, hopefully setting me on the right path. Uh, so on that note, we'll get started. Uh, I thought a good way to start here would be to discuss a brief history of happy hour. As it turns out, uh, happy hour first actually uh, started back in the Navy in the 1910s. Uh, this was for seamen that were out uh, on the sea and didn't have much to do. And so every week they would uh, host these events called smokers, um, at which time they would uh, have boxing matches, wrestling, uh, and uh, as the name would imply, would enjoy a cigar or a cigarette. Uh, and at that time, alcohol was not really involved. It was sort of one part of it, but it wasn't just an alcohol-centric event. Um, then in the 1920s and 30s is when prohibition uh, set in. And as we know, alcohol was definitely involved at that point. Uh, that gave rise to the so-called speakeasies where uh, people could go before dinner uh, to have a drink uh, in a secretive location uh, and then go on with the rest of their day. Uh, but during that time also, uh, people needed uh, different types of beverages to uh, enjoy. And so mocktails started to become uh, particularly famous and uh, popular. Uh, and the most uh, famous one that we are aware of is the Shirley Temple. Uh, Shirley Temple was a very famous child star uh, on TV. And um, it was said that uh, one of the 
Hollywood uh, restaurants or diners that one of the bartenders made her uh, the classic Shirley Temple as we know it now, which is 7-Up with some grenadine. Uh, and interestingly enough, Shirley Temple herself actually hated the Shirley Temple, uh, but every time she would go somewhere, they would make it for her. Uh, and so she would take a sip and say it was too sweet and then pass it off to somebody else. In the 1960s um, is when sort of the contemporary happy hour came about. Uh, this is when restaurants and bars begin to offer discounts uh, for patrons to come and enjoy a drink or a, or a snack or a small bite. Uh, and this was popularized also sort of in the quote unquote Mad Men era. Um, but this is when executives were drinking uh, scotch during the day, uh, taking naps in the afternoon to sleep off hangovers. Um, I'm hoping most of that has changed maybe uh, there's some uh, parts of the financial industry where people still uh, drink in the afternoon, or at least the show Billions that I'm watching, they certainly do that. Um, but it also became fairly clear that there were significant health consequences to uh, drinking alcohol in excess. And as a result of that, in the 1980s, uh, there started to become happy hour bans uh, in many states across the United States um, with the uh, goal of avoiding uh, binge drinking. Um, but fortunately, as most, as many bans go, this one was repealed, uh, except uh, happy hour is still banned in, uh, in uh, these eight states, uh, many of which have uh, excellent hand fellowship programs, and I assure you this had uh, no impact on my uh, rank list that I submitted last week. Uh, now there's certainly been a resurgence of uh, speakeasies, uh, mixology, uh, and that certainly carries over into non-alcoholic drinks as well, uh, and that sort of brings us to today. Um, as Dr. Wang uh, alluded to, the uh, sort of mixology has been in the, in the popular uh, media as well. There has been uh, a variety of uh, uh, celebrities uh, mixing up uh, cocktails and sharing on Instagram as well as uh, um, other social media platforms. This is Ina Garden making a massive cosmopolitan. And so I thought for those of you who might be interested and inspired by this, we could uh, talk through a, a, a few basic tips and tricks about uh, how to become your own uh, amateur mixologist uh, like myself. Uh, first thing to start with is some basic bar basics and tools. Uh, you're going to want to start with a nice mixing glass like this one, a cocktail shaker plus a strainer. I prefer the Boston shaker, which is uh, pictured here. It's a two-piece uh, shaker that allows for more dilution and more uh, um, basically circulation of the fluid as you're uh, shaking it. Uh, you need a, a jigger, which is basically just a measuring device. Uh, this is my favorite jigger here, and it has one side that goes up to two ounces, the other side that goes to one ounce, and then hash marks in between. You'll need a good bar spoon, as ergonomics do matter. And then the three basic glasses you'll need to make most cocktails are a rocks glass, a coupe, and a highball. So ingredients, I always tell people you should go to Costco, because that kind of has the mid-range uh, liquors that pair very well with most uh, cocktails. You want to have a good bourbon or rye. I prefer Woodford Reserve uh, for most uh, uh, that call for bourbon. A nice light or dark rum. Uh, tequila, I think you can get lost in all the different types of tequilas, but a good Blanco or Añejo will uh, go a long way. You'll want a good gin. I like Bombay Sapphire because it's a bit more floral uh, and pairs well with most uh, gin cocktails. Um, and though I'm a strong, uh, uh, I strongly despise vodka, I think it's good to have it around just in case. Uh, in general, I think vodka doesn't actually have any specific flavors that it brings to the party. It just makes it an otherwise uh, great drink, just more alcoholic. And so uh, you can avoid that if you'd like. You always need fresh lemons and limes, nothing that comes in a carton or a, or a plastic uh, container. Um, simple syrup is good. You can always make it yourself and save money. It's just one part sugar to one part uh, water. Uh, boil it and then uh, let it cool. And that'll keep for a few months in the uh, refrigerator. You can always add a few drops of gin or vodka help it stand, uh, stay a little bit longer uh, without going bad. Uh, my favorite bitters are Angostura bitters, which go in most cocktails, and the Regan's Orange Bitters number six, uh, which are great for old fashions as well as a variety of other cocktails. And then you'll need some seltzer as well. Uh, we have a soda stream. I think that that's um, uh, particularly helpful when you need uh, soda water uh, at a minute's notice. So some tips and tricks if you're making cocktails at home. Never pre-chill your ingredients. I'm not sure where this started, but uh, a lot of people store their uh, liquor in the freezer. Not only uh, is that not ideal in terms of creating dilution with ice when you're actually making the cocktail, but your um, uh, ingredients can pick up some uh, funny smells and uh, tastes as well in the freezer. Like I said, you always want to use fresh citrus to squeeze for every cocktail that you make. 
you want to stir clear ingredients. Uh, clear can be a bit confusing. It's not just the gins and the vodkas, but anything that you can sort of see through, even sweet vermouth or wine count as uh, clear ingredients. And you want to shake opaque ingredients. That generally includes uh, citrus, um, creams, egg whites, those types of things. Um, so the, the classic um, adage comes from uh, James Bond when he says shaken, not stirred. Uh, but this is definitely actually not the way to make a cocktail because what James Bond is doing is taking a bunch of beautiful clear ingredients uh, and telling a bartender to shake them. Uh, and what that does not only is bruise the gin, but it makes for a very cloudy looking uh, martini like the one pictured here on the left as opposed to the nice clear one on the right. Um, and anyone would tell you that the, J uh, the martini that James Bond is drinking in that top picture has certainly been stirred and not shaken because it's nice and clear. Um, it also does bruise the ingredients uh, such as gin. Um, so definitely uh, you want to stir when you have clear ingredients. Uh, on that note, my favorite martini recipe involves two ounces of gin, three quarter ounce of dry vermouth, two drops of the orange bitters I mentioned before, a nice lemon peel, uh, some olives to taste if you're interested, and then of course stir. Uh, and here's a dog shaking a cocktail for anyone that's interested. So today's quarantine themed drinks, we have three. Um, the first is a penicillin that uh, I'm enjoying as well as uh, Dr. Ladd, cheers. Uh, this is a, a nice drink because it has a, some lemon, has honey, uh, some ginger, all the good things uh, for when you're feeling uh, down. Interestingly, the penicillin cocktail actually didn't come around until the mid 2000s. It was a riff on sort of a classic sour, uh, which is um, a base spirit, um, some citrus and a little bit of sweet. Uh, gin and tonic, you can never go wrong, um, especially now that uh, hydroxychloroquine has been in the news. Uh, tonic gets its sort of uh, classic flavor from quinine, uh, and there are variations of it that we sent out in the recipes, and I hope uh, you're able to enjoy those at some point. And then finally, for a, a nice mocktail, uh, honey blackberry mint one. Uh, this has the nice therapeutic properties of honey, some vitamin C from the blackberry, and mint as well can brighten your day. So on that note, uh, uh, you can always just reach uh, for a Corona so you can fight fire with fire. Uh, but I hope most of you are uh, enjoying a nice cocktail this uh, afternoon or evening. And on that note, uh, cheers and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Great. Right. Thank you, Sahih. Great. Excellent. <clears throat> I'm actually, I forgot one slide on my, I'm sorry, I just... Uh... Got to introduce, just because I had to show this slide, Doug, I'm sorry. Um, so I introduce <laughs> you today. Uh, we have from Stanford, Dr. Ladd, who's going to be talking about her PIP joint 30 years later, and our twins from uh, opposite coast, Dr. Hanno and Dr. Roosh. Dr. Hanno is my partner at UW in Seattle on his disorganized case, and then Dr. Roosh from Duke on affected elbow. <laughs> All right, I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Ladd now. Okay, I want one of those orange shirts. <laughs> You're about 20 years too late. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Are you seeing my screen? Um, yeah. yeah, perfect. Excellent. So my case is 35 years after a PIP implant. And although I didn't put it in, I'm going to own it as if I did. I haven't been quite in practice that long. Uh, you may, if you're like me, the gallery is on the right side of the screen. So if you may need to adjust that, if you guys can see it. So this is a 52 year old woman and I'm going to invent part of the story because I don't know it, but it's, it will bring us to date. Again, I'm gonna own it. So she had a complex PIP fracture dislocation that was treated with pins and then got infected and may have had an external fixator. And long story short, when she was maybe 20 or 21, she had a PIP silicone implant in it. And it worked well for many years, 20 some odd years or so. Um, she was married and she wore a ring on her left uh, ring finger. As you can see, uh, when she presents to me, she's got a swollen, deformed finger and there's multiple scars here. And she basically says, it's useless. And can you do something? And I look at that and go, oh, oh. Um, and here are x-rays. And how do you want to do this, Jerry? Do you want to, um, you want to be the moderator and pick on somebody or? Um, I'm giving you free reign. So you have free pass to call on anybody. 
Um, Anybody in this whole array of gallery of the Brady Bunch? Yeah, gallery of panel that uh, you have free reign. Uh, oh, you mean my two colleagues? Um, so I, a little caveat: I don't do elbows anymore, so you I can say you can't call on me for the elbow. <laughs> um, but <laughs> um, oh, Doug, dear Doug, yeah, friend of mine, tell me. You know, these are are really really difficult problems. And if there's any joint that I try to avoid at all costs, it's the PIP joint. They all make me look really bad to say. And so when, when I look at this lady, and uh, it's kind of like, do you want this finger or don't you want this finger? Because the easiest thing to do is be to remove it. If, if we're not gonna remove it, I don't think I personally, I technically can't replace it. So then I have to fuse it. And if I'm going to fuse it, I actually call Marco Rizzo and at the Mayo and I say, tell me how you're fusing these guys now. Because I don't think anybody has a bigger experience than he does. But I think looking at this, trying to preserve this, I don't think I can replace it. I can try to fuse it. Yeah. Okay, so anything you wanna do in her workup? And, and you wanna tell us about the x-rays? What were you, what concerned you, what just had this still, change over a couple of years? Still me? Um, well, Dave, <laughs> why don't you give us your thoughts? <laughs> You have a lot of bone loss um, that's uh, going to be challenging to make up. You've got diaphyseal bone that you're going to be trying to fuse to diaphyseal bone is disvascularized. Um, and you've got an angular deformity, which makes it also difficult to correct. So a lot of times an arthroplasty becomes a soft tissue operation because you've really, you're just rebalancing the soft tissues. Uh, so you're, you're going to have to make up length. Um, and uh, to Doug's point, uh, you don't have a lot of bone to work with. Um, so uh, options uh, would be um, some type of uh, Guy Fouché vascularized toe. Uh, that's an option. Um, you, but uh, that seems uh, a little bit wasteful uh, to me. Um, and uh, the other would be to do some kind of masculine technique, which would probably be what I would uh, probably espouse to, which would be to put in a cement spacer and a, um, a plate and uh, come back and do uh, a cancellous graft. Okay, yeah, all great thoughts. I don't know if you can see that x-ray very well, you probably can't, but on her dorsal side of the PIP joint on this lateral film, there's rimming calcification that goes way into the soft tissue and extends volarly quite a bit. So she's got kind of like a neoacetabulum, if you will, with that middle phalanx with consideration of uh, considerable bone loss, just as you pointed out. Um, so I got a, that's right, I got to these down here. I got an MRI and uh, just to get a sense, because I was <laughs> concerned about particulate debris uh, as part of a destroyed PIP joint, thinking infection, thinking of a lot of things. And so does that add anything to you guys? Does it make you steer one way or another um, of doing fusion in situ at same sitting? Uh, still want to do the exchange, Dr. Roosh? I mean, I think it's un, it, it would be a, a strange infection that would last uh, 20 something years. I mean, uh, it, it happens. Um, 30 something. But, yeah, 30 something. But um, uh, assuming uh, that when you open it and you put your plate on for your masculine and your cement spacer and you do your cultures at that time, I think you're going to have your answer um, then, uh, which would probably uh, be adequate for me. So can I ask a question, what would make you just halt this operation? As in, you go in there expecting that you're going to find a big glob of, of cinnabitis or silicone reaction, particulate reaction, and then 
take that out, are you going to go straight away or is this going to be a stage procedure? Well, I, I, you're asking me, that's exactly where I went to. I thought tons of debris, that's going to be a challenge. Um, I thought, given what I've seen in particulate synovitis, that is, you know, 10, 15 years, that it would be not horrible to take out. I think typically you've got this hunk of plastic and then you've got debris. Yeah. So I was even considering an exchange arthroplasty uh, if there was no signs of infection. Um, so with that, because I know we have two yeah. more cases, I'll proceed. Anything before I tell you what I did? No, yeah, let's find out what you did. That's what uh, Amy, about. I have a question. If you're going to replace this with an arthroplasty, how do you ad adjust the coronal plane deformity? I find those very difficult to do. <laughs> they always look like they're getting better, and then when they come back to the office, that coronal plane deformity yeah. I find very challenging to correct. Sure, even in the primary, it's really hard. I mean, I tell people for primaries, I can... Pain, pain relief is predictable. Range of motion is probably what you started with. And even though I can make them pretty straight first off, um, they tend to drift back to where they started. So I never promised that. Um, but if, if motion and pain relief is, is what they want, then I tend to do it on anybody. I tend to do it on index fingers, small fingers, and young people if it's horrible, which is why I say I'm, I'm owning this case. Um, so, uh, and also back to this x-ray, that dorsal bone loss turned out to be hugely significant and bone loss over here. So talked about that. Uh, there was debris everywhere and it was like get, trying to scrape out tofi or toothpaste or something. It was not real hunks of stuff that felt satisfying with synovitis. And it took quite a bit to get most of it out. And it had to debride a fair amount of bone, and it was just too unstable for an attempted implant. I actually had the trials there, but the the amount on that radial condyle of the middle phalanx was so um, deficient <clears throat> that it wouldn't even hold the stem. So uh, I did a distraction arthroplasty, um, kept her in just this pin for um, six weeks and came back and so you see her here and i now have two year follow-up we we did this what we call a truce you know she says i don't want anything more oh, this is good enough it it uh it doesn't hurt and i'll live with it and so um rod and she uses these rings because it's a little wobbly but not as wobbly as you think and rod rod hence had told me years ago about taking pip implants out and never having to fuse them, um, and even though you're anticipating it, that they tend to do well because there's some sort of space there. So um, it's a disaster with a truce. Uh, have you guys had any experience like this? Anybody? You know, I, I haven't with, with PIP joints, and it's, but this, this is a great example of listening to your patient. and. And then instead of saying, okay, fine, you're not going to let me operate on you, get out of my office, it's kind of like, okay, let me help you figure out what we can do with this finger. This is a great example, Amy. Any other faculty have comments? No, I see Lee and Tom Fisher on there as well. Any thoughts on uh, anybody would consider a two stage implant arthroplasty on this? Or I'm just kind of curious what other thoughts, other. Mm -hmm. Lee speaking, I think that basically uh, this was a wise plan that Amy, that Amy did. And uh, the only thing that I would have probably done differently is when I've had this and they don't want a fusion, remember fusion, you've got to make it so short because of the quadrigia, you're going to screw up the adjacent border digits. So fusion of the PIP joint is never a happy procedure unless they're short enough that it doesn't look very cosmetically happy. Uh, but I take a page out of uh, Hanel's book and use a bridge plate. And we put bridge plate on a couple of these and just left them there. So they're sort of fused for a few months and at about 10 to 12 weeks, just taking the bridge plate off. And they have enough scar that you often get a kind of uh, fibrous uh, stability overall. Um, and other than, I don't think it was infection. It looked like silicone synovitis once you have it in for so many years. And Amy did a great job at least getting alignment. This, I agree with um, with uh, Walter the getting alignment in the coronal plane and having any sense of stability, even when you have it fibrous like this, is is always tough. 
Amy, Jim, uh, Jim Steichen was about the same kind of um, era as uh, Rod Hance. And Jim showed me a case one time where he took just a bent wire, you just take a four bend wire, like a spacer wire, mm -hmm. put it intermedullary down the uh, P2 phalanx and down the medullary canal of P1, leave it bent at the, about oh, 10 or 20 degrees and leave it in for three months, go back and cut the wire, pull it out and use the silver ring splint and a hinge. And you know, the joint's denervated, the capsule is really, really thick. And so overall, these uh, probably have a decent stability, but Jim's got a, um, a case a lot like this, only he just used a spacer wire rather than a, mm -hmm. a oblique wire. Did you leave the wire out or did you bury it? I actually left it out. I mean, the residents know I hate wires. I never know whether to bury them or leave them out, but I left them out. She was, you know, she, she didn't want any more procedures. It was pretty clear and she was really <laughs> diligent about it. So I, I think a home run at six weeks here. That's great. That's okay. And then I'll two years or whatever this final yeah. follow-up is. Silver yeah. ring splints work great. Yeah. And they're attractive. So, um, Okay, uh, let me get you the screen back, Cherry. So thanks, guys. All right, thank you. It's a great case. Doug, you're up. All right, let me see if I can share my screen. Oh, there. Let me go here, right? Share. And let me go over here. And we try this to go. Did that come up, Jerry? Yep, yep, you're all set. Perfect. Okay, so this is, uh, as you know, in Seattle, everybody and their brother rides a bicycle or tries to. And this is a 46-year-old who falls from a bicycle. He's commuting to work, the full-time lab tech at uh, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, which is about uh, well, a mile or two from Harborview. And he's a part-time violinist. And that's how he describes himself. So these are his fractures, and they're bilateral, and they're, you know, they're comminuted, and they get C something, you know, so they, you want to see three threes or whatever, but they're just comminuted with, with, with compression in place. And so what I did is, is I, he gets referred to me, and I take him to the operating room, and I operate on the left side first, and, and I'm doing that, putting things in place, and and so I get this reduction. And I'm pretty happy with that. When I have this level of comminution, especially in, in dorsal or in bilateral cases, if I've got an unstable construct or one that I'm, I'm concerned about, um, I'll put bridge plates just to, to offload it. And I, I happen to use the, the second dorsal compartment um, to do that. So. And so in the, the right side, you know, I put it together and I think it's, you know, it's pretty good. And I like the construct and I just leave it at that. But I didn't put a, uh, a bridge on this side um, because the pieces just fell into place. And, you know, you say, okay, well, that's fine, but here's a real telltale right here, okay? So that there was an implant there that came in and came out and, then we put up with this implant and things seemed to, I thought were going to go well for him and for me. And so at two weeks, we take out his sutures. His left distal radiolar joint is really stable. He's very mobile. So I put him in a short arm cast. His right side is DREJ, his pronation, supination, pretty stiff. And so I, I, I refer him to, to physical therapy. Goes to physical therapy. He's about four weeks out. He starts playing violin. Again, starts riding his bike. And it's kind of like, dude, don't want you to ride your bike. He rides, but he does anyway. Um, pretty smart guy. And uh, he, he thinks he knows, and, and he says, you know, I, I know my wrist, it's gonna do fine, and we're gonna do well with that. And so I see him at five, five and a half weeks. His left's doing great, and here's his right. So, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, you can tell me what the, you can pick a side and tell me what to do with it. What do I do with the right? Oh Lord. Um, 
you know, it looks so good. Uh, I have to ask, so why did, did you put like a bowler plate in and take it out because it, it, you thought it was so stable? Was that those screws? Oh, those screws were an attempt at putting a, a bowler plate in. And it just wouldn't, I could hold all the distal fracture, the fracture fragments at the, at the bowler owner corners. So I thought I'd put this together and it held so nicely using this wire form. And I was able to reduce the right side and you know, I, my mea culpa, and I, I, I really blew this case. And the thing that I blew on is I, I should have taken and put some sort of real support as in a radial column plate you know, kind of, you know, combined with that. So Yeah, well, hindsight is everything, right? So, yep. I mean, you, you reconstituted the radial column with a percutaneous pins, but um, what's troubling, so there, uh, there's a lot of youthful folk on this call and uh, they haven't used the TriMed like you and I have. And that, that little pin plate was a godsend. And um, I think, I don't know, if you go back one, I just want to see where you put it. Um, where did you put it? Let's see, right there. Yeah, so you put it in the subchondral bone, and it looks like you put it in the fracture and how the, that was originally described, right? You did, yeah. did right. So, and, I it, and I thought I put it in the right place. And, and yeah. just so, you know, I always, after doing this, if I, the, the thing that would have really defined whether or not I was going to put a bridge plate on this one too, is that I do AG's maneuver where I try to translate the hand relative to the forearm and see if I can rock it off that bowler on a corner. And I could, and because of that, I thought I was done. I see, got it. So go back to your, your next film. So it's, you know, it's almost like he fell. It looks looks like a, a wire form statue or something, but um, yeah. you know, it's, it's like it's sprung and I wouldn't have been able to ex explain that or see it, but clearly, with hindsight, that was such a tiny rim, uh, distal rim of that uh, volar ulnar corner that it just kind of popped. Yeah. Um, so then the question is what to do next. Uh, are you asking me or you want to pass well, it yeah, I think let's, let's pass it around. I, I think you're going to put it back together. <laughs> Yeah, well, wow. it, it begs the, the volar issue if you want to do something even volar, like a volar uh, spanning yeah. plate. So. So hey, ahead. Dave, Roosh, are you there? Yeah. What are you going to do other than stop laughing? A nice orange shirt. I still have my orange <laughs> shirt. But. Well, I think one of the things that probably needs to be said is that uh, that owner corner that you got one wire in um, was not really attached to the piece that you got the other wire in. Yep. So you're uh, really relying on two very thin wires that have a very long span before you get down to that pin plate uh, and they just spread apart and uh, and that's how it failed. Um, and I agree with you that hindsight's 2020 and that uh, neutralizing would have been great. Um, and the question is now, uh, is it possible to to uh, push that piece up and, and neutralize it? I, I tell you, I probably bat about um, 75 percent with these that I can uh, push it back up, uh, put a pin plate on it and a bowler and a uh, uh, dorsal spanning plate and leave it uh, and uh, mobilize it in supination about 60 degrees and then hope that uh, everything gets sticky enough that the piece stays where it is and doesn't just die. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it will just uh, die uh, even though you uh, think that you've got uh, blood supply to it and um, in that case you're going to do uh, a radioscape illuminate and probably from a bowler approach. All right. So as you may or may not know, I always think that Tom Fisher is the smartest guy in the room. And, and so Tom, you got any comments on this? Um, nothing more than what's been said already. I, I do worry like uh, Dave does about that bone resorbing and it may not necessarily die but certainly the uh, 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 osteo, um, osteogenic properties of it uh, aren't very good and they uh, just kind of absorb away from bad blood supply. 
uh, I, I know there's no doubt I'd put a spanning plate on it as a, I mean, for years we did 4K wires and a X fix, mm -hmm. and we put the joint together with just a bunch of K wires. And then these fragments came, or these fragment specific uh, fixation came along in the mid 90s. And um, what I've always uh, not liked about this particular pin plate is the lever arm between the very distal portion of the wires that do a great job of getting subchondral, but uh, it's a little rickety in my book. So I try to always slide that, that keeper plate up distally as far as I could go. The problem was, was uh, you have that teardrop and, and the plate would come off the bone and it would sit proud and it kind of does that already. But nonetheless, I'd probably put a, just a, a wall plate there. I'd get a big heavy plate on the Palmer side and just hold it up like a buttress and try to mash it down with a, with a, um, a clamp and then, uh, Put like just like you did there, and um, then put a span and plate on dorsally. Yeah, and, that, and that's actually what I ended up doing with this is opening it up, trying to. But I actually did a dry scope on this uh, because I just so that I knew that my articular surface. Do I, have a, I don't. Know, I think I do. Yeah, just so I know that this surface right here uh, is is actually congruent right there, and so and went through a bowler approach and I, you know, this is just a big piece of metal that conforms well to the distal radius. Um, so we, I am not wedded to any particular system um, with that. And then we put a, a bridge plate behind that. And that's the right redone. The distraction plates are off at 16 weeks. Here he is at uh, 40 weeks post. And uh, I see this guy about, uh, oh, about every six to, to nine months because he actually lives in my neighborhood and he continues to do it. Does well. he have a houseboat? Um, no, he lives above mm -hmm. the houseboat okay. in one of the condominiums up above us. So. so was it easy to put that roller piece back in place? Well, I'd really like to tell you that I didn't struggle at all, but I, <laughs> I, str I struggle with those. And I, and uh, you have to, and, and I purposefully, people laugh at this, but I, and my, my fellows think I'm crazy, but I don't use tourniquets because this case took me about two hours. And, uh, and the reason I don't use tourniquets is, is that you can control almost all the bleeding within the first 15 minutes. And then you don't have to worry about, about swelling from tourniquet and tourniquet pressure and closing this wound and I can, I don't have to worry about what's about time. I take as long as it takes to get this done. And that's something sort of that I learned from one of my partners, Steve Banershka, who will take hours, maybe days to put together calc <laughs> fractions. But, um, and so that's what I did. And yeah, so this is, these are, these are his results. And that's the, the end of the case. And that's how I got out of that. But it's, if there's a take home message, it's, yeah, it, do what you know is right as opposed to what you think is right. And, and this was, and, and most, most of the times when you think you can get away with something, you really won't. And so this was a case where I thought the fixation was good enough. And the take home lesson for me is if you think it's good, good enough, it probably isn't. So thank you. So here's okay, my you know, Doug, real fast. Uh, two two things. One, I, I think uh, it's important to note that you have to be able to get that piece back up before you decide that you're going to salvage it. Yes. Uh, uh, so you go in uh, with the intent to salvage, but if the piece won't go back up there and the carpus won't follow it, then uh, it doesn't really matter what else you intend to do. It's not going to happen. And then the other thing I wondered is, do you routinely release the carpal tunnel because they've been in bowler flexion for a while? You know, I, I, I do. And, you know, so my exposure for that is an extended carpal tunnel incision with yeah. the incision going from, you know, the carpal tunnel and then 
uh, when at the distal radial crease, I'll angulate the incision towards the radial edge of the flexor carpi ulnaris and then sweep it back at about 120 degrees. And so my interval of dissection is always between the carpal tunnel contents radially and the ulnar neurovascular bundle ulnarly. Get down to it, I destroy or throw away the pronator quadratus. I have no respect for it. Um, and uh, then I'll, I'll lift up that fragment and, and mobilize that fragment. And I've been doing that. So that's a good point, Dave. So thank you. Uh, when, Doug, when you have yeah. bilateral plates on, essentially stiff wrist, did he complain about hygiene care? You know, they don't. You know, and, and they actually don't. <laughs> they, they're very happy when they get rid of one of their plates. You know, but um, that hasn't been a, a real, a real issue with uh, that that I've had. Uh, I don't know, my patients when they have bilateral plates or whatever that leave them with no motion in the wrist, they usually want about twenty degrees, where they come in with all kinds of inventions for uh, washing oh. their back and other kinds of things, from long sponges to all kinds of things to hang over the shower, etc. Yeah. One other thing I would say, if you can't get that piece up, would you, um, David recommended going to a fusion. One neat little trick, particularly in younger people, if you still have good articular um, surface that Jorge or Bay taught me, was you can do an osteotomy. When that piece is resolved and you don't, and you don't have a piece that you can kind of tie in, you can actually make an osteotomy and tilt the whole volar cortex up superior. And he showed a case with about a five year follow up with excellent results of a teardrop you know, from hell with no teardrop left kind of thing. So it's just a kind of, if you can't get that piece up and you don't want to go to a salvage. Yep, we've, and we've done that. We've also uh, <clears throat> taken articular, taken a toe joint and taken out a, a middle phalanx of a, of a second toe and made that articular rim and put that in place. And that's a, a case that I frequently show at Rod Maddox courses and those sort of things, um, and at risk courses as, a, as something that you can do in these particular cases. But yeah, if you have the option of doing an osteotomy and rocking that up, I would. The other thing, to, in, in the, the fusion that you could do or would do would be a, a radio lunate fusion. Yeah, that's uh, your salvage procedure. So, well, and one of the things I was thinking in revision was to go back and put a volar plate on, like the like a fusion plate, a, a limited fusion plate, and just mm -hmm. use it as a provisional um, spanning type plate, as if it were a radial lunate fusion, but not fuse it and then come back and take it off in some months, like a spanning. Yeah. Plate. yeah. That's a great idea. All right, so there is, there's my indications for it. I guess I, I have to add this. It's probably one of the things I do most is, is salvaging one, my mistakes and uh, a number of other people's mistakes that, that seem to find my way. Um, and I think this is an example of where bridge plates actually do really help out. If you have that bowler owner corner that you think you've repaired, you do an AG maneuver, and it dislocates or subluxes over that boulder lip, putting on a spanning plate works well for a while. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. I'm going to take you. Um, I'm going to take you off there and uh, have Dave Roosh. Yeah. So are we, uh, is my, are my slides up? Uh, not yet. Are you able to figure out the share screen on your? Oh, there it is. Share. Sorry. How's that? Yep. Great. So you want to go to slideshow on the, there you go. How's that? Mm, Perfect. There. Now we'll go as soon as All right. Perfect. Uh, so yeah, this is about, uh, mistakes. Um,
and certainly uh, like everyone else I have my more than my fair share um, but uh, you know um, Jim Urbanic uh, has a very uh, wry sense of humor as you might imagine and uh, he said well one day he was asked about his experience with uh, TEAs and he said, well, I, I, I have a, a vast experience with total elbows. I've done well over 300 total elbows. Of course, it's all on the same 58 patients. And um, I think that for all of us who do these, it does sometimes become uh, a, uh, a really uh, difficult decision to embark on this journey because you're really wedded to the patient. Um, this is a, uh, this is a, a trail of tears. Um, that started with uh, Ralph Coonrad uh, in 1980. Um, uh, this was a 30-year-old female with uh, post-traumatic OA. She'd had multiple procedures, triceps insufficiency complicated by infection. Uh, Dr. Coonrad did a total elbow on her in 1980, uh, and he used to keep her in his um, uh, in his slideshow on total elbow arthroplasties because it was complicated by a candida infection, which he says that he cured with a combination of whirlpool and uh, hippocline sponges. Uh, so uh, she actually did clear uh, the infection uh, and uh, was pain-free, actually pain-free for, uh, for nearly 28 years. Um, uh, when she presented back to Dr. Bannock uh, with uh, uh, pain, uh, and his conclusion in his note is uh, a loose total elbow, Coonrad type two with ulnar nerve neuropathy. And he did a revision uh, arthroplasty on her, and those are the x-rays uh, right here, as you can see. Uh, at the time, uh, he had no uh, positive cultures uh, that were taken. Uh, and no evidence of infection. Uh, she did well postoperatively, went back to Washington, D.C., where she did well for about two years, uh, represented uh, to one of my partners with uh, increasing pain uh, with the diagnosis uh, in his note of bushing wear and the recommendation of uh, um, observation with uh, activity modification, um, where she then presented. Uh, in 2013, uh, in my clinic, accompanied by Dr. Coonrad, who always used to accompany his patients to the clinic, uh, <laughs> with um, a uh, uh, malaise, a night sweat. She really looked very, very ill just on physical examination uh, and um, had an um, uh, elevated CRP. Uh, it was fairly obvious that uh, there was a, uh, an infection going on uh, at the time. Uh, so we uh, proceeded uh, the next day to take her to the OR for an IND. There was no obvious purulence there, uh, which I uh, should have been uh, my uh, clue. But uh, again, I kind of put my head in the sand, as you often do with these uh, infected total elbows. So she underwent irrigation, debridement, and bushing exchange, uh, post-op cultures grew growing candida. ID recommending uh, six weeks of IV uh, with uh, a uh, prolonged course of uh, fuconazole. So uh, with that, I'm happy to uh, take any suggestions at this point because uh, at this point I'm out of uh, my league. Anybody in the, in the uh, call have any ideas of uh, great ways to salvage these? Maybe you want to call on. Do you want to, uh, Jeff Greenberg still there? Sorry, I'm just going to arbitrarily call on folks in the, uh, in the audience. We're all staying on mute. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's crickets uh, out there. Um, Boy. The I'll unmute, I'll talk. Well, okay, you can, you can of course talk. You'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always. I'll take a shot. Yeah. Um, what are you going to do you about know, it? I mean, the, the, the real question is whether you want to take the device out and leave any kind of antibiotic in and kind of leave her with a flail elbow and then come back some point and try another elbow is certainly uh, one uh, thing. 
in ones where you get a lot more infection and more resorption, um, Tommy Graham introduced the cue ball elbow, which is where you essentially fill the space with uh, methyl methacrylate balls, very much like baseballs uh, in a batting cage kind of standing there. And while it looks about the weirdest x-ray you'll ever see, I've got about seven patients who we followed, who that's all we've done. And they have a relatively uh, stable elbow and have maintained their hand function. Uh, they don't have a great elbow for lifting with force, but it's not totally flail or helicoptering. And so one of those two options is kind of going to be up, up my tree. So at, any, have you uh, ever cleared, and this is my question, have, have you ever cleared a Canada? Yeah, that's a good question. Because I never have. I mean, and, and, you know, unfortunately, the only way that I ended up clearing a fungal infection is with amputation. Yeah. Uh, so just, uh, just as an aside, um, this is a really long humeral stem uh, with a lot of cement uh, up there. Um, and I, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but... Uh, the, the nice line uh, dra drawings from um, uh, the Mayo Clinic always make it look like you can do this uh, perfect osteotomy and, uh, and have it uh, just peel out. Uh, and um, Bob's your uncle uh, really has not been uh, my experience uh, with these. Um, so uh, nice I, think, big vein. I, think they look, I think they look great in, uh, in drawings, but not so good in real life. Yeah. So, um, excuse me, Dave, what did your ID folks say? I mean, Canada of, you know, some 30 year duration is not. I, I, I can't even pronounce it. I can't even pronounce the name of this drug, uh, let alone its side effects. And, but, but something oh. indolent that. Yeah, that okay. looks good. I'm just curious of what they would, they recommended. They recommended, I assume, more than six weeks, like lifetime of PO yeah. something? Yeah, suppression on fluconazole. Yeah. But, you know, the, the, the fact is that you're never, uh, at Duke, you're not going to get an ID consult without a hardware removal at the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, That's not an easy hardware removal. You're right. No. Yeah. So uh, that was, uh, I, I got her out of the hospital, much to my great uh, satisfaction. Uh, and uh, at her six week visit, um, she presents uh, again with night sweats, fevers, malaise, um, uh, and obvious um, uh, illness um, with uh, an aspirate that I did in clinic that had no fluid. Uh, but after prolonged conversation with her, uh, we elected to go back to remove the prosthesis. Uh, and uh, at that point, I felt that uh, you know, to avoid an amputation and the possibility of perhaps some type of um, uh, just a resection arthroplasty with uh, chronic bracing, uh, that I would like to try to get her cement out. Um, I don't know if you guys use the ultrasound cement removal uh, equipment, but um, uh, that's what uh, I used. I was very cognizant of the case report that uh, Mark Cohen presented with uh, a radial nerve palsy uh, using this device. Uh, so I, I did the entire thing under uh, fluoroscopic guidance. Uh, I never penetrated the cortex uh, with, the, um, with the cement removal. So you know how this goes, right? wakes up complete radial nerve palsy uh, <laughs> with, with horrible, horrible causalgic pain uh, and um, writhing in, uh, in the uh, hospital bed uh, from this uh, causalgia uh, in the superficial radial nerve distribution. Uh, so we had placed a cement spacer at the time uh, and uh, at this point, uh, um, Lee, uh, um, well, obviously you probably may do a block to get rid of that causalgic pain just to make her, uh, comfortable. 
Um, I guess the real question is, do you think somehow, I understand you didn't get it with the heat gun, which has been reported, as you said, by Mark Cohen, and I've seen at least one case uh, in removal. Uh, is your cement somehow also in, in, impinging the nerve? And I mean, in some ways, I guess, you may have to take uh, a look at this nerve if it doesn't quiet down, not the palsy portion, but the, the causalgic pain. Um, you know, I, I think when you're in there, there's so many scar tissue pull going this way and that way after two or three operations, infection, et cetera, that that radial nerve isn't necessarily where you, where you expect it with your retractors and somehow it often gets caught in the melee. Yeah, I, I um, uh, got her um, in pain control um, and, uh, uh, braced her from June of 13 through February of 14 with no recovery of her uh, nerve function. She's now uh, fairly addicted to narcotics, which I was very happy with, and uh, has a, a flail elbow uh, at this point with uh, chronic pain. Um, so uh, we discussed uh, tendon transfers at the time. I obviously discussed amputation. Um, uh, she was adamant that that was not what she wanted. Uh, so we uh, did radial nerve uh, transfers. Uh, I think Rob Kamal actually was the fellow at the time. I looked back at the note um, and it was a very good operative note, Rob. Uh, and uh, cultures were negative and uh, she remained very stiff with her digits despite extensive therapy. Um, so uh, to put, uh, to get just going up to the really good part. Um, now, April of 14, she's getting up from a pew at church, um, feels a pop, and uh, she fractures above uh, her cement spacer. Uh, again, discussion of amputation, uh, again, refusal, um, IND, uh, purulent fluid, uh, cultures had one coag negative staph, uh, but otherwise were negative for bacteria uh, with uh, a uh, DC from the hospital on bank and fluconazole. Anybody get willing to throw in the towel yet? You know, unfortunately, I was going to do that like a year ago. You know, yeah. This is, and the, the reason I say that this year, I, I, I've got PTSD from yeah. this case. Yeah. 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 This, I've got this case in my life, and the outcome really was never good. Yeah, the rem it's, it does kind of bring back nights, west, chills, and fevers. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to you. Uh, <laughs> did she so, have, did her causalgia improve at all prior to this, or was it always just a horrible? She fall? was getting better, actually. She was actually getting better uh, with the pain control. Um, uh, in May, we discussed the fact that she could no longer live her life like this, uh, that she wanted to have a revision um, of her TEA. Uh, Whoa. And uh, <laughs> that uh, I said uh, that I was not going to do that without um, getting negative cultures. So I took her to the OR. I revised her space, her wrapped her neuroma in continuity, which uh, was, uh, looked like I had cooked the nerve with the, with the cement probe through the bone, which I guess has also been reported. Uh, and um, uh, cultures were, were negative at that time. Uh, we continued oral fluconazole. Uh, in July, uh, we took her back uh, and revised her. Uh, with a long stem up into the humeral head. So fortunately now I can do a four quarter amputation uh, and uh, she's got um, cement, uh, she's got struts, uh, fibular struts, uh, but probably more significantly to this point, uh, we did uh, her ulnar component into the radius due to the, the loss of bone in the ulna. Um, and I think that's the point of this, uh, if, I, if I might, is um, uh, that uh, has been uh, successful for her. 
she is no longer on antibiotics. Uh, she is a caregiver for her grandchildren, uh, and she uh, has uh, survived this uh, prosthesis being put into the radius. And we have a series of these now where um, uh, she um, is in a brace for life, by the way. Uh, but we have a series of these where we've been able to get the infection out uh, with uh, just not even going back into the ulna. And I think it does, uh, it does somehow matter that you're putting into virgin territory. It, it helps you. Uh, but uh, there, uh, for everybody on the call, uh, it, you know, there is no situation that personally I can't make worse. Um, implantation of the uh, forearm component into the radius, uh, I think, is a good salvage uh, for these uh, chronic problems with uh, TEAs. And of course, uh, probably the most important thing I can tell you is that with the total elbow, uh, it is once with the li uh, knife, yours for life, um, or in Dr. Banner's case, uh, at least until you retire. So uh, uh, thank you, uh, and uh, thanks for setting this up uh, to the folks out there in Stanford. No, thank you. You know, and just this total elbows are the one procedure that if I'm not comfortable with that patient, I'll find one of my partners who that patient is comfortable with, meaning that that it's it's a lifetime. This is an annuity policy. They every total elbow has a 100 percent complication or revision rate if that patient lives long enough. And long enough seems to be somewhere around 15 to 20 years to do that. It really is a, a true commitment. And so I, I'm, I do them, but I, it's not my favorite operation, not because it's not fun to do, but because I know what the long-term consequences of every total elbow is. So. No, I, mean, I agree with Dr. Hanna and Dr. Rich. I, I mean, these are hard conversations. Patients come in with horrible deformity whether it's rheumatoid or post-traumatic and they have an elbow that's destroyed, but they want a total elbow. But I have a patient that goes in and out of nursing homes and she has kind of an alcoholic history, but her elbow is awful. And I mean, once you do the surgery, like Dr. Roosh, Dr. Handel said, you're committed. So these are patients that if they assist on surgery, I pass off to Dr. Hanna or Dr. Kennedy and uh, <laughs> want to take them on. <laughs> well, thanks, Jerry. Yes. <laughs> but you know, do, doing nothing about a candida infection, they can end up with brain, spine, or heart. Um, uh, it's basically their immune system just doesn't do it well. So uh, doing nothing about it is not necessarily uh, in her best interest, but suppression, lifelong suppression, and clean it up, that's certainly. Uh, Dave, I, I kind of disagree with you about the ultrasound and the osteotomy. You can do an osteotomy and still use the ultrasound. And you use a limited uh, opening of that humeral shaft, and it's a little hybrid uh, operation to knock some out, ultrasound some out, but also uh, open up your radial nerve and put a silicone sheet um, underneath it uh, just as an insulator because it sure gets taut despite how much fluid you put in there. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. It's an honor and a pleasure. All right. Thank you, everybody. Great webinar. Um, so next week, I'll be sending out an update to the folks, but it's going to be on cubital tunnel. So it's a severe cubital tunnel with intrinsic wasting. It's going to be moderated by Fraser Leversedge. So um, hopefully you can join and stay safe and stay healthy, everybody. And great to see you all. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, Thank you, Jerry, for putting this together. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you.